WandaVision breaks ground as the Marvel Cinematic Universe's first television series, while One Night Miami and others represent promising streaming film releases for 2021. I'm Joe Aserno. And I'm Darius Delsoin. This is Cinema Unchained. Okay, so welcome to now episode four of Cinema Unchained, One Night in WandaVision. The punny title for that comes from the fact that today we're going to be looking at the first couple of episodes of the new Marvel series, WandaVision. We're also going to be taking a look at the details that have been revealed as far as the production of, production of Deadpool 3, the streaming film release, the massive streaming film release schedule for Netflix for, their, for 2021. And we're going to be capping off the show with a review of One Night in Miami. And before we get into WandaVision, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell to get all notifications if you're watching this on YouTube. Check out our social media platforms in the description, as well as our channels on Apple and Spotify podcasts. Now, getting into WandaVision, joining us today is one of my best friends and the host of the Yapping Yankees podcast. One of my best good friends, Mike Scudero. Mike, how are you doing today, pal? I'm doing great, Joe. How about yourself? I can't complain. And if I could, who'd listen? As everyone said, I'd stop and shop when I worked there every time I bring up their items. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, th- um, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the podcast plug, too. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you got it, pal. It's all about a cross promotion, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Darius, you want to tell us exactly what uh, WandaVision is about? Lead us into it. Sure. So WandaVision basically is pretty much after Endgame, we follow Wanda and Vision after the events of Endgame into what we honestly pretty much don't know. All we know is stuff is going down in the small town. And basically, throughout the show, we'll be uncovering what exactly will be happening. And so, just to start off with my opinions on WandaVision, when my dad and I first saw it, uh, he was a bit, like, odd. He was like, okay, this is interesting. For me, I instantly loved it. I instantly liked it. I liked that they were going for this very sitcom-esque uh, feel. And I knew it was going to be a sitcom going in, uh, because that's what they've been heavily promoting in, uh, among on those lines. But one of the things I really like about WandaVision is that there are certain moments throughout the episodes, the first two, because the first two released uh, on the same day, is that they ha- they instantly try to almost try to connect the dots of certain things of what's actually going to go on within the series. And me as a comic nerd, I'm already connecting some of these dots. And I'm already speculating who the actual villain is. So it's going to be interesting to see at the end of the series how it's all going to play out. Because very much in the first two episodes, very ambiguous and it doesn't really tell you a lot of what's actually going on which i really which i think is a really interesting take for a marvel property to do because a lot of marvel properties even even in the films they pretty much always show and tell you what's actually going to go on and what's going to happen there has been occasions where they do flip it uh in certain movies like iron man 3 and other cinema and other marvel films but with this one they're very purposefully not like really telling you almost anything what's going on how did vision come back and this and that and the other so i find it to me i thought it was really good i really liked it some of the comedy did fall but that's all right i mean sitcom not every comedy is going to uh, uh you know nail it for a lot of people but for me i really liked it i thought it was interesting uh, certain Easter eggs stood out to me, and I was like, oh, okay, they might be going that route. Okay, interesting, interesting. So for me, I really liked it, and I really enjoyed it, and I can't wait for the third episode. What about you guys? Megaluch, I guess. I, you took a lot of the words out of my mouth, Darius. I, I, uh, <laughs> like, 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 I was even like, I, I, like towards the end of, of what you were saying, I was going to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to mention like the like the fact that there were little Easter eggs in there too. I'm like, oh, hit on that too. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, honestly, I, I I hate to do this on like a, an interview like this, but I feel exactly the same way as Darius. Pretty much, I loved how the show started with that like 1950s esque sitcom sort of feeling. I loved that, and actually, a similar thing as you too, Darius. I watched I watched it with my dad yesterday when I was at his house because um, my dad's favorite Avenger actually happens to be Vision. So when, really, okay. yeah. So when, when the show came out, um, you know, because there had, there was like nothing with Marvel last year in 2020 because of the virus. Yeah. You know, it was like dead zone with with Marvel. So because uh, Black Widow was pushed back, like their plans got all messed up. But um, but when the show came out, I was like, oh, my dad's gonna love this show, and I'm I'm gonna love it too because it's the first thing of Marvel in a long time. I'm just going to, I can't wait for it. 
Um, when I first started, I loved the tone that, that it started out as. And in the first episode, my dad was was also like, yeah, it was it was okay, it was fine, whatever. He's like, it had a very sort of a uh, like um. Oh God, what's his name? Uh, like a, a Dick Van Dyke show, sort of like that sort of feeling. He said that's what he compared it to. Yeah. Um, Same with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so um so that's that's the feel that he got from it. I personally love the tone right off the bat. And the second episode was really like there were some Easter eggs in the first episode. I'm not going to spoil what they were or anything, but. Then in the second episode, like, that's when they started to maybe sort of poke at a little bit, like, what is probably going to be going on here. Like you said, Darius, the direction they probably plan on going in. And I love that they didn't reveal much at all, too. I also am a fan of that. Um, but, but like you and, and other big Marvel guys, I, I have a couple of theories in my head of what might be going on here. But it's, it's just so fascinating so far. Like, I, I'm, 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 I, I actually didn't even see Darius. Maybe you know better than me. How many episodes are supposed to be in the first season? I, I read like nine or something. Like nine, nine? yes. Yeah, so so I, I there's plenty of time to uncover this, um, and I, I can't wait to see where they go next. Because again, I have my own little thoughts and, and theories in my mind, and I can't wait to see if those directions are actually correct. That's what I, I just can't. Exactly. You know, building on the whole fact that you guys actually have theories for where this might go just shows the contrast <laughs> as far as like how much more into comic books you guys are. Whereas opposed to me, I can't remember the last time I even picked up a comic book. But kind of building on both your points, like as far as like the whole uh, 1950s sitcom feel of the show and how it's balanced out with like a sort of mystery to it, too. Like, don't get me wrong. Like most of the episode there's again, that Lucy that I love Lucy feel. But then there are moments or there are scenes where it takes a total shift in another direction just for that one scene. and. It feels like a seamless transition. It catches you off guard in the best way possible. Like, I feel like jarring is the wrong word, but it's definitely really noticeable by the time that transition is done. I'm like, oh, shit, this is where we are now. And when it gets there, it's really, really good. Even if it's um, comparatively like a brief, um, it's really only a brief part of the episode. So those little sneak peeks as far as like where the show seems to be going it's very intriguing, and I real and like I said, when we were talking about the show before it came out, Darius, and how yeah. I said that I love that I have no idea where this is going to go. I still have no idea where this is going to go. <laughs> well, just from a, just from a lack of comic book um, perspective, and yeah. just from even a storytelling yeah, perspective. Here. Like again, yes. I have no idea yeah. where this is going to go. I can't wait to see what co- what happens next. Believe it or not, Joe, I actually, the theories I have aren't even based on the comics, actually. It was just, like, putting together some of the Easter eggs and things like that. Like, that's, yeah, yeah, that's honestly, like, where a lot of my theories come from. Like, I didn't read an unbelievable amount of comics. I get, I actually get most of my comic book information from our good friend Jordan. That's where I get most of my comic He's an encyclopedia. (laughs) I I have read some comics, but he, like, he's, like... Please, he probably he probably knows him like the back of his hand, but he knows him better um, than Stan Lee did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but um, but yeah, like honestly, the theories that I put together in my head are, are literally just from putting them together from the Easter eggs a little bit. Like it, it was just, it's crazy. The you the word that I used, I didn't use the word jarring. I I used the word trippy. I thought a lot of that, like some moments yeah. in the show, like, yeah. really trippy. Like, like I. I but I love that. Like when you don't get a lot of answers, and when there's such weirdly fascinating moments that happen in shows, like the way they happen in Wandavision, it just gets me so hooked. I love it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, like for me, when I watch Wandavision, one of the like, even though I know a lot about the comics and everything, like, and among those lines and Scarlet Witch, who she is, and the many different iterations that they went with her, there were certain pieces of dialogue that stood out to me that were like, oh, okay, we're going there. Because Scarlet Witch in the comics, she's one of the most powerful mutants ever. That's pretty much like she is powerful. She can alter reality at her will. Um, and just to give you how powerful she is, uh, Joe, she was able to eliminate every single mutant in Marvel Comics just by saying it. Wow, she's not uh, she's not someone you want to stand up on a date, huh? Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, like her, and one of the things about her, especially knowing that this is going to uh, tie into Doctor Strange's Multiverse of Madness is that they're diving into the mystical side of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that's what Kevin Feige said a lot. So for me, when I hear, okay, they're diving into the mystical aspect, okay, maybe we're getting the witch-like version of Scarlet Witch where she's actually using more magic, maybe based abilities. Uh, one of the things 
that stood out to me was the fact that during the promotion and even some of the casting that they announced, they still haven't said the villain. And of course, one of the big things that Marvel likes to do is really amp up the villain as well. But they haven't done it with WandaVision, which makes me question, okay, what is or who is the antagonist? And another key line, there's a key line in the show that not a lot of people are probably going to pick up on that I think is going to tie into the Doctor Strange movie and even Spider-Man possibly. So, like, this is definitely a really interesting jumping off point, a really interesting property to jumpstart the the next phase of the MCU compared to, let's say, Falcon Winter Soldier, Hawkeye, etc. Because for me, I've always loved Scarlet Witch, and I'm happy to see that they're giving the amount of time necessary to dive into almost the psychological aspects of Wanda because they they slightly spruce upon those things in Age of Ultron, in Civil War, definitely in Civil War, and even in Endgame. And so seeing how that all of that's transitioning into WandaVision, and it's, to me at first it was very abrupt because it was almost like she's into a whole new character. But again, certain lines of dialogue and actions were kind of like, oh no, we're, this is still the Wanda that we all know. It's just... You don't know what's going on. And I love that reality sort of warping aspect that we do kind of see even in uh, in certain episodes in certain episodes and certain points of the series. So for me, as a start off into the next phase, I really like it. I really enjoy it. I can't wait to see where it goes. I already have a bunch of theories, as us Marvel fans kind of always do. <laughs> um but just in general, just narrative wise, especially in the bigger scheme of things, it's going to be really interesting to see how they connect the dots in the other shows. Because if there's anything Marvel and Kevin Feige really know how to do well, it's connecting those dots. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think another reason like why this these first couple episodes are so strong are, of course, the turns from um, Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany as um, Wanda and Vision, respectively. They have great chemistry together, and it's funny. When you see them in the movies, they don't really... There aren't... They don't really have like a lot of comedic points in their performances because it's not really required of them in their storytelling whereas with this once again this show or at least the first couple episodes very much um pay homage to like again the old sitcoms of the 50s and the 60s the i love lucy's the honeymooners and they pull it off very well they pull it off very well there's a very tongue-in-cheek feeling to it all and again i think that's in part due to them and how well they do in these roles and their chemistry with each other is of course terrific and i want to see again what directions as performers or even as characters they all take they take this into like in the coming episodes yeah and exactly um what darius said i like how he pointed to the, to the true power of wanda and i think that's why even though they showed they definitely showed indications of that in the movies but they definitely had to nerf her a little bit because if, if you have her go at full power she could just literally defeat anybody anybody yeah. It, it, like that that's that's why even in endgame for instance like she was literally picking up thanos off the ground and just like tear, you, she was like if he didn't have the ship the ship rain fire on them she he was she was just gonna tear him to pieces like and and just like in civil war the scene that i like the most just she just like almost bullies them she, she sends vision five stories down with no problem uh when, when i think it's black panther and bucky were fighting when they were at the airport um yeah. and and she just like picks up black panther and tosses him to the side like a rag doll yeah like it's it's and she just says you're pulling your punches just goes on in the next one and throws somebody else aside like or even in ultron she could cause unbelievable damage by getting into someone's head like bruce banner turning him to the hulk and having him destroy a whole city yep <laughs> so it's it's like we know her power and we're seeing it in wandavision now just what she could do it's it's unbelievable and and i love I really do love how this show, as Darius also said, is going to be like a stepping point to what's going to happen with all the, I mean, I hate to do a little corny plug here for the second Doctor Strange title, but it's literally going to be like madness in the multiverse. Like, Mm -hmm. so, and I can't, and I'm so excited that this show is going to be like the stepping point to that. It's like, it's so interesting where it's going to go from here. Like anything can happen. Like anything is possible. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like it's going to be interesting. We don't know what it's going to be, but like, there's a confidence there that like, oh, I'm liking where this is going to go. And I'm li- and I'm excited to find out where exactly this is going to go. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I know I'm 95% confident that it's going to be great. And I think another thing that Marvel is really in a unique place at, especially with WandaVision, that these episodes are relatively short. They're around, like, the first episode, I didn't realize it ended already. I was like, whoa, that that's it? 
And then I was like, okay, the second episode is out. I see what they're doing. Um, and so I think that purposefully making these episodes 20 to 30 minutes long, so that's roughly what they said it's going to be about, is that every time, I think every episode will be important at, at um, uncovering the layers of what's actually going to be happening. So therefore, I feel that this show, and which I really like, is that I don't think every episode is going to be a filler as I thought it would be. Because I thought this ep- this series would definitely have some filler episodes. But the tone and the approach that they're going with feels as if you need to pick up on those little details to really know what's going on. Which, for me, I like those type of shows. I like the ep- I like that episode that the episodic structure of that. So I'm very excited to see that going forward next week, the following week, as we discuss this more. It's going to be really interesting at how they start peeling back certain layers and how they start revealing certain things. Because right now we're still in the sitcom era. We've seen a bunch of other eras in the t- in the series, and it's going to be nine episodes long. And the fact that it's going to be 20, 30 minutes, I think it's really going. It's going to be really important to really start paying attention. Uh, in the third episode and beyond. So. so, yeah, I think so far we're off to a really good start. And for anyone who's either watching or listening, I'm curious as to like what you think of the show so far. If you have any thoughts on WandaVision, don't be shy about typing your mind in the comment section below if you're watching this on YouTube or even just responding to us on our social media pages. Just, again, anything that you have to offer as far as like you know what you think of the show so far. And it's going to be coming out, like the next few episodes are going to be coming out week after week on Disney+. Plus. And Mike, I just want to say thank you very much for joining us. And just out of curiosity, for anyone who's watching or listening that might be a sports fan or a diehard Yankees fan, um, can you tell us exactly like where we can find your um, podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yapping Yankees is a new episode that drops every Sunday night, except for tonight, because uh, last week and this week, I'm actually on a two-week break from doing it, but we're going to start right back up next Sunday, the 24th. Uh, every Sunday night, there's a new episode, and you can find Yapping Yankees on YouTube. Uh, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. So four different platforms for those of you that might be only exclusive to one. Or if you could listen on all four, that's great. You have a lot of options in front of you. So um, so that's where you can find Yapping Yankees. And I really appreciate you plugging in, Joe. Thank you very much. Anytime, pal. Anytime. And again, I, pre- I very much appreciate you coming on. This is, a, this is a great time talking about this show. I figured if there's anyone who we should have as a guest, like one of the first things that we talk about in terms of Marvel, like, you know, you were one of the, you were the first guy that came to mind. Don't tell Jordan. That's all. That's, that's all I'm gonna, don't tell Jordan. I, 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 we'll we'll I have him on. That. We'll, we'll have him on for sure. I appreciate that, guys. And and it's again, it's just so great to finally be able to talk Marvel again because 2020 was so dead quiet with it. So yeah, it was just, what so a awesome. shit show! Like 2020 was just an all around yeah. shit show, and like yeah. of course, like you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe didn't escape that. So. Yeah, I, I think I think 2020 was like the first year since like 2009 or something that that a, that a new Marvel movie didn't come out or something like that. It's crazy. Yeah. But so, yeah. it's what it is, you know. It'll be something to tell our kids and grandkids about, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank Anytime, you. time, pal. Thank you, Mike Cedar. Cool. Mike Cedar, everybody, look him up. <laughs> all right. All right. So, all right, moving forward now. Deadpool three. Darius, what do you got for us? Yeah, so, so yeah, a few, a couple days ago, maybe last week, Kevin Feige sort of, sort of did an interview, and he pretty much said Dev- Deadpool 3 is officially in the works, script is underway, and one of the big things had, that had me worried was that now that Disney acquired Fox, will every Marvel property on the Fox be PG-13? Because I think one of the downsides not really a downside but for me personally i really like it when marvel properties go nitty-gritty go very dark very gritty take some serious aspects and i'm not saying the mcu doesn't do that they definitely do civil war or winter soldier definitely had some mature themes but they still had some comedic elements overlaid um to that extent whereas the marvel netflix shows you have shows like daredevil and luke cage and iron fist even punisher punisher just all out blood, gore, every uh, amongst those lines. And so for me, knowing that all these Fox properties are now back, and one of the biggest hits that Fox has had was the Deadpool franchise, to be frank. Ryan Reynolds knocked it out of the park with Deadpool 1. He is Deadpool, nobody else. That like that, that like he's really made that character his own. And even Deadpool 2, which I liked even more than Deadpool Same 1. Here. And he still yeah, and they still stuck to the comedic elements of Deadpool, but they still 
also stuck to the rated R uh, rating for the blood, for the gore, and along those lines. So one of my worries was that now that it's under Disney, will it be rated R? And now it seems and pretty much confirmed that it is not going to be PG-13. It will be rated R. Um, and they are making the next Deadpool movie. And he even teased, again, not confirmed, but he teased that he may be confronting other characters in the MCU, which is going to be interesting. Yeah, so and again, so that, for me, that brings me to my next point, too, as far as confronting other characters in the yeah. MCU. He's going to be in, like, you know, another, like, you know, Captain America movie or whatever, or if he's going to be in another Avengers film. Is he going to still get to be his rated R self? Because I'm assuming if he's in an yeah. Avengers movie that's more than likely going to be PG-13, is he going to still be his full entire, you know, naughty mouth self? <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. And that's another worry I do have because it's like, it's okay, it's great that you're still sticking with the franchise. You know, individual, you're doing the Deadpool, third Deadpool movies rated R awesome. But if you're planning on crossing him over to the MCU, you're going to have to tone him down a bit. Mm -hmm. And that's going, that's going to feel very disjointed and very abrupt because it, to me, I think when you have that rating of R and PG-13, they're very drastically different as well as sometimes tonality as well, depending on the property. Um, however, I do think they can play with it, Deadpool, in a PG-13 setting mm -hmm. with its comedic side. Yep. But again, because of the lesser curse words and the profanity that comes from the work with the mouth is going to really feel disjointed. So that is another worry I do have. They haven't said that they are crossing him over with the MCU. Maybe they don't. Maybe this is going to be the one character that they're not going to because it's like, let's just finish this Deadpool mm -hmm. off. Maybe do our own with a different character, different actor that can fit into the PG-13 setting. That's what they could possibly do. I, I, I don't, don't think I don't so. Think, I don't see that. The, yeah. No one else can be Deadpool, at least in our life, and at least in our generation, no one else can be Deadpool either than... Ryan Reynolds. It's like I remember when Chadwick Boseman passed away. Unfortunately, they were talking about like p potentially recasting um, T'Challa, his character. And I'm like, no, that's yeah. not going to work. It's not going to work. It's there's not. too much of a personal. Exactly. There's too much of an attachment between the actor and the character in the eyes of the audience. So that's not going to work. Um, as far as Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool being in like you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe, hanging out with the Avengers, I think there is a way to do it. Because if you look at the yeah. Marvel Cinematic Universe films, there are a lot of like you know sexual innuendos too here and there that are thrown out for comedy. And I feel like if they amp that up with Deadpool, should he be in the films, I think that could be a way to possibly offset the fact that he can't drop as many f bombs. Or hell, even when you know he wants exactly. to drop an f bomb, I could see him like if he's in an Avengers movie, I could see him like breaking the fourth wall, be like, "Oh, can't say that. I already said that this time. This is a PG thirteen movie." I could totally, <laughs> exactly. I could totally see that happening. Yeah, and I think if they did that, I think that would definitely feel like, okay, it's still Deadpool. It's just the writers are very self-aware of who and are aware of who this, this type of character is. He does break the fourth wall. He does have profanity. So if you can, you know, like you said, I think that would be a perfect way to really, uh, not perfect, but a very beautiful way to actually integrate him into the MCU with the rest of the characters. It would be interesting to see that. Or you have another character from the MCU just cross over into his standalone movie then you can do have a bit more profanity. That, that's, um, that's interesting, too. That's an interesting way to go about it as yeah, well. Yeah, so, like, one of the popular pairings that people want to see Deadpool with is Spider-Man. Yep. Uh, and, of course, uh, from the comics, they always have a great back and forth, so him with Spider-Man would be so interesting as he's, he Mark with the mouth doing all these F-bombs, and, and, you know, Spider-Man's like, well, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be such an interesting you dynamic. You shouldn't do that, Mr. Poole. Uh, <laughs> 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 but yeah like i love deadpool it's going to be great to see him really coming back because i know after the acquisition even ryan reynolds was unsure what was going to happen and to hear kevin feige pretty much confirm that yes it is in the works script is in the works it will be rated mm -hmm. r they're, they're sticking to that that has me very excited for the foreseeable future of deadpool as a character and even as a franchise and how he's going to integrate into the mcu and considering kevin feige said that they now have a plan of how to incorporate the X-Men in. It's going to be really interesting going forward. Mm. Yeah, and then again, it's funny too, like you mentioned Ryan Reynolds. Um, apparently he's supposed to be like looking over like the writing of the script, 
but he doesn't have like a writing role. I'm thinking to myself like, okay, if he has like such a big influence in it, why doesn't he sit down and write the script himself too with like who else is writing the script? Yeah, definitely. Like he's, he's done so well with that character because after I remember with X-Men origins, Wolverine and that iteration of Deadpool, of course that was Ryan Reynolds, but it's not his fault. How they did that character was just so poorly that there was such backlash. And knowing that Ryan Reynolds is a Deadpool fan and he wanted Deadpool to do Deadpool 1, and you just see how much, like, just because it also shows you that rated R superhero movies can be done, done mm-hmm. well, and can make you money. And I think Deadpool 1 is a perfect example of that because they just went above and beyond with the character. Surprisingly a good story, which I didn't expect to be a really good romance film really as well romance action comedy uh from a deadpool property which is shocking but you know they did it well interesting characters introduced interesting dynamics great dynamics great acting across, uh, amongst almost everyone for me personally so i am happy they're going forward just a bit worried and how they're going to incorporate him in the mcu considering the tonality of r-rated and pg-13 I think they still can do that by, and a lot of people, and including myself, I feel that you can do a PG-13 but really on the edge of becoming rated R. And if they can do that with Deadpool, for example, then I think it will be a much easier transition. However, I still want Deadpool to be rated R because they've already established that. Mm-hmm. Despite what people say that, oh, he shouldn't be rated R, he can be PG-13 easily. We've already established a rated R setting with him. Just finish it off and then try to find ways to incorporate him properly in, into the rest of the MCU for a better consistent storytelling and narrative structure and stay consistent with who that character is still. Hmm. All right. So for anyone who's listening right now, who's um, heard this conversation between Darius and myself, what are your thoughts on what we know so far about Deadpool three? Are you confident in how the film's going to turn out? Do you think it'll suffer from second sequelitis? Leave your thoughts in the comment section. Once again, don't be shy. And just before we get into our next topic about uh, Netflix films, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to give this video a like, the channel subscription, and hit the bell to get all notifications for new content. And also check out our social media and podcasting platforms if you already haven't. The social media platforms as well as the podcasting platforms should all be in the description box below. Now, Netflix, uh, after cashing in on the disaster that was 2020 when no one could go outside, they're looking to have another very ambitious year for 2021. They are currently set to release 70 films. That's over one film per week. 70 films this, films this year. That is nuts. Yeah. <laughs> like every single week, we're getting a new Netflix film. Because one of the things with Netflix that I have kind of really didn't like from them as, uh, is that they don't really promote a lot of their films. And they don't really... A lot of their films are TV series. Unless it's popular, like Stranger Things. They're definitely going to promote mm-hmm. it. Um, so knowing that every single week, and we're getting a more consistent schedule from Netflix, because sometimes Netflix will just drop a show. I have no idea. I start watching it. Oh, this is great. How do they not promote this? You know, like this is such a good series. And so, or movie or whatever I've just watched. And so knowing that, hey, there will be more consistency going forward this year with uh, all the films that we have planned going for it. I'm really stoked for that. I'm really excited for a lot of a lot of these films because they have such a star cast. And of course, Netflix is pretty much up there when it comes to like, if you had to compare regular Hollywood with cinema and the movie theater experiences and who can prefer, who can actually go up against them. Like, let's just say sim- in a simpler term, Netflix and streaming, they can definitely do that yeah. because now even those casts, those stars, are doing more streaming service properties as well. Uh, we have Dwayne Johnson, Gal Gadot. I mean, Ryan Reynolds already had a relationship with them with Six Underground, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and so they just have so many actors now up their sleeve that they can continue to keep going forward. More new original shows coming out this year as well. Uh, Halle Berry is doing her first film, Bruise, which I'm pretty stoked for because one of my friends has actually was on that set. So I'm pretty stoked to see that. <laughs> um, so like they just have a slew of shows and movies that are coming out. And knowing that they're, they're more consistent with their uploading and more consistent with their release schedules has me really excited going forward. Because now every week 
I can't wait to tune into Netflix even more than I already do. Right now. Yeah, because they released their sizzle reel as far as like the stuff that they're looking to have come out this year, and it is looking very interesting. One of the things that I noticed was that you have the films that Netflix are made seem to make themselves. There's a romance film with Zendaya and John David Washington that was filmed in secret during yeah. the COVID nineteen pandemic, or really at the um, when the pandemic um, was much worse. And it's called Malcolm and Marie, and it actually, you know, number one, it looks it actually looks pretty interesting, and it comes out on February fifth. So you have that, but you also have a film that was scheduled to go into theaters. It was a Fox film it was scheduled to go into theaters last year in May, called The Woman in the Window. It was with Amy Adams, and it follows this woman who's agoraphobic who believes she witnessed a murder of her neighbor across the street. Um, and so it seems like Netflix just just took that film and now i'm not sure exactly when that's supposed to come out but like it was on the list of confirmed netflix films quote unquote for 2021 so it's very interesting um to see exactly what netflix is doing just just in this year alone because like i said they had an amazing amazing 2020 like you know it sucks that the covid pandemic covid19 pandemic happened but there's one company that really cashed out on this it was netflix i mean just look at the smash success that was tiger king and once again, that came out at like the height of the pandemic. That was a huge craze in large part because everyone was home. And so they just sat down and watched Tiger King. They didn't do anything. Didn't yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're like, can you imagine the, what the makers of Tiger King are thinking <laughs> when all this was happening? And They're their like, show, whoa. they're like, all right. They're well. like, you know, crazy docuseries end up being like the smash success that it was. So, and, you know, this brings me to another point too, as far as like how much Netflix is coming out with. Once again, 70 films in one year. More than one film per week. Do you think it's too much? I don't think so, mainly because, as we you said just now, and, and what Netflix is doing is that it's only one film, or I think series, per week. So I think with that in mind, and what the how the streaming service has evolved over time, and that a lot of people binge stuff, is that, hey, you can binge a series on a weekend and still look forward to the next weekend because a new series or the next film comes out. Um, or now, if they have a release schedule, figure out the days or like, okay, cool, I'm going to watch this, watch this, watch this. Because I think, because one of the things I don't like too much a lot about Netflix is that, is there consistency in typical? Because again, like I said, they sometimes will drop something out of nowhere mm-hmm. that I had no idea zero promotion, zero marketing for that property, even if it's just a couple of days of promotion, you know, maybe a couple of trailers out for it on their Netflix channel would be beneficial because as much as Netflix has a lot of content, they don't promote every single one of them. And of course, that's going to be expensive in the long run. But if you can at least do some sort of trailer or sizzle reel towards this property or some kind that maybe you see has potential, I think that would be beneficial um, and would help out a lot of the uh, the understudies and the undershows that probably don't get noticed that should mm-hmm. get noticed. Uh, another show, I think roughly the last two years, that dropped out of nowhere, had no idea, was called Locked and Key. And I liked, a lo- I liked the hell out of that show because it was such a, fan- it was a fantasy sort of mystery uncovering show. You had kids dealing with... Um, their own internal dramas, but as well as trying to uncover these keys that can unlock doors to certain mystical areas in their world, which I really enjoy. And I was like, yo, how come nobody knows much about this? Mm-hmm. And then, and this is when it roughly came out. I already watched it. Two months later, oh, now it's in the top 10. I'm like, it should have been there before, or, or that sort of along those lines. So I think them at least saying that, hey, here's our release schedule, release window. For these movies that now you can look up and now we know the titles of these upcoming movies and shows, I think will definitely help Netflix out in the longer run. And hopefully they do it next year as well. Even if it's not on a monthly basis of what's coming out, at least on a yearly and they separate it into this month we get this, this month we get that. Um, And just the start of every month, refresh it for everyone's minds to go back on Netflix. Because, I mean, everyone goes back on Netflix anyway. Almost every single person in the United States and probably around the world has a Netflix account. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, I made the poor... They, they're already powerful right I now. I made the poor mistake of 
asking someone whether or not they had a Netflix account instead of just assuming that they did. Just like, you know, like, oh, everyone has a Netflix account now, just kind of like they have Channel 7 on their on their TV. Yeah, so. that's one thing probably almost everyone yeah. does. So. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I'm excited to see these upcoming movies and shows, especially the ones that I know that intrigue me and interest me, uh, just from the cast alone and even sometimes the concept of it or just visually. Like, I still wanted to see Outside the Wire that recently came out on Netflix with um, Anthony Mackie as the super, super soldier android sci-fi action up my alley. You know, I don't care if it's that. I just want to see action. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to see that. But again, I think Netflix has it really going strong for them this year, considering that almost every single movie, a lot of movies are either getting delayed again mm-hmm. to later this year into next year or going on streaming services. Yep. So. Yeah, so again, Netflix once again seems to have really put a lot on their plate. So now, again, just moving forward, um, the last segment that we're going to have for the show today is going to be our review of One Night Miami, just waiting on a dear friend of mine to come into the show. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. All right. I can't wait to talk about this. Yeah. Now. And uh, <laughs> just before we get into just before we get into uh, one night in Miami again, anyone who's still watching, um, is there any thoughts that you have as far as like Netflix putting out as much as they are? Um, do you think we're getting an oversaturation? Do you think Netflix is kind of suffering from Apple syndrome where they <laughs> where they release a new product <laughs> like almost immediately after the original after the one that just came before it? So I'm curious as to what all your thoughts are. Again, don't be shy. Like I said before, to cap off the show today, we're going to review One Night in Miami. Um, the film follows four civil rights icons, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, Jim Brown, and Muhammad Ali, at the spending a night together in the Hampton House in 1964. And joining us today for this review is my friend Michelle Batista, a talented, aspiring actress, one half of the Power Broke Girls, that, and just an all-around doll. So, Michelle, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I try. I have my moments. So, now, Michelle, uh, I guess we should have done this with the first guest that we had, but uh, since you're the guest, you really should go first. Uh, what, what exactly uh, are your thoughts on One Night in Miami? Hmm. General, um, I liked it a lot. Um, it, it humanized for historical figures of our time and our the past time um it showed them it showed like an array of colors it showed them being frustrated being very happy being very silly um it's not just like the stereotypes of who malcolm x was or muhammad ali you know sam cook so it just i think it really humanized the characters which made it they just it made you relate relate to them in different ways and I'm sorry if you guys can hear my dog. He's trying to, he's scratching the door right now. So I'm ignoring him. Um, but yeah, overall, I really liked it. I kept like, like closing my eyes. Cause I'm like, is someone going to get killed? I'm like, because I, we know who died. Like we know who's dead and who's still alive. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so I'm like, is, are they going to show it? Or is this just going to be? So yeah, I'm not going to spoil anything though. Yeah. So, you know, funny, building on the whole character thing that you were talking about, again, that's one of the things that makes this movie so strong. Um, there's a really just, like, full realization. Even though this is a fictional account, there's really just, like, a real full-bodied realization as to, you know, who these people are, who these people really could have been. You see their insecurities. You see their internal external struggles. You also see their camaraderie, camaraderie with each other. And you also see their conflicts with each other, too. And uh, I just loved seeing them just, you know, dick around with each other. Like, I just never, I never pictured them in that sense, but I loved watching them do that. But I also loved to see them kind of just, like, butt heads with each other, too, at certain points. Because yeah. one of the things about this film is that most of it takes place in a motel room. Mm-hmm. So there's not much space to back off from each other. And sure. when you don't have too much space between one another, tension usually starts to build. And that tension is a lot, it's very intriguing to watch unfold. I loved how even it goes from the conflict building between them and the tension building to, once again, them just, like, having a great time with each other. 
and that transition back and forth always seems seamless. It always feels like it feels like a roller coaster ride that never really goes. It doesn't feel like it's going down. Like yes, it kind of goes in different directions. Like it kind of zigzags back and forth between like different tones and different moods, but it never feels like it's going down. It never feels like it's calming down. And in a film like this, I never thought that would be the case. And even in terms of like the characterizations too, they all feel like their own. Um, they all feel like their own people, which when you have four people just bouncing off each other in mostly one space for a long time, that's very hard to do. That's very hard yeah. to accomplish. I definitely feel like um, it's just friendship. Right. It's like they're they when you have friends that believe in your potential a lot, like you feel comfortable talking to them because, you know, it's like unconditional love. Like you're not going to just tell a random stranger certain things or with a certain tone. But with my best friend, I will definitely feel comfortable telling, like checking her and being like, hey, listen, yep. you're better than this. I see you this. So, you know, and that little push and shove. But then they're cracking jokes, listening to music. Um, yeah, and I liked it a lot because it's some, I didn't know certain things. Like I didn't know that Muhammad Ali was so young, you know, when he became like known as the world's greatest. Um, so that was interesting. And, you know, Jim Brown, I, f I always felt like he was a little older because he seemed more mature than, yeah. let's say, um, uh, Sam Cooke or, or Muhammad yeah. Ali. And then I, I Googled it and he was a little bit older than them. So I was like, okay, that makes sense because he seemed maybe the least, um, not controversial, but he seemed like the least agitated person in the motel room you he know more reserved. He was definitely yeah reserved. that's a good word he was more reserved he was kind of like trying to be the peacemaker a little bit but still like assertive you know not really passive he's still like hey don't mess with me but we should just chill um and muhammad ali was just like hyped up and just trying to um so it's really cool to see all those different tones yeah and energy darius do you have any I know you have thoughts on this. Yeah, of course. Really, really uh, just so, um, like, for me, knowing, especially, I live in a family that they very much adore being black and uh, respect their heritage and respecting um, the black community and supporting black community and black actors, actresses, just basically wanting to see young African Americans to do well, especially considering the amount of racism and stereotypes and prejudice that we, you know, face and everything. And so when I saw it last night, it was relatively late when I got home, and my dad really wanted to watch it, but he was too tired. So I kept watching it. If there's any complaint I do have, because I do have one, is that I wish it was longer, because the dynamic between the characters and were so intriguing and so interesting, because every character and who they are really stood out to me. And for me, considering the biggest, really the biggest scene and the biggest moment they took time in, that was really long, but I loved it because there are so many different perspectives and so many different ideals and ways to handle and how they approach to handle racism in America and how they want to do well. And you see Malcolm X's point of view. You see Sam Cooke's point of view. Um, and to me, that dynamic, especially between those two, because they were talking about it, I was like, this is really well done. This is really excellent. This dialogue, that yes. really hit, that hit. The music hit right there. Almost everything. I have almost no problems except I wish it was longer because there were so many interactions, especially one of them that I was like, okay, this is unusual. But then at the end of that interaction, it hit and I'm like, there it is. Okay. I was about to say, this this guy's too nice, <laughs> um, especially back then. And oh, so, right off the bat. I was like, yeah. and oh, there it the is. Beginning, right? That beginning scene? Exactly. For sure. And there it is. I saw that. I saw that. I'm like, oh, wow, this is going, this conversation is actually going, it's actually really pleasant. I'm like, is this too good to be true? Exactly. Like, and I was like, that's too like, nice. <laughs> then something happens. I'm like, there it is. There, there it is. <laughs> yeah. And that's sometimes how uh, it happens, you know, to a lot of people. My mom and a couple family members, like, no. That happens to everyone. Things. That happens to every person of color, especially black people. Yeah, I, I first I want to tell you guys that Darius, I'm so happy um, that you're black because the coming to, I'm gonna tell you why. <laughs> uh, because coming, like, okay. coming to on the show, I actually wanted to ask Joe previously. I wanted to ask him, and I forgot to, if another guest or the host was gonna be a black person because I do feel like we need if we're gonna talk about this film, a black person should be present because it racism, colorism. 
everything about the movement, we shouldn't have a conversation with just a Spanish girl or a white guy or Asian. It should be a black person that knows like his roots, his or her roots, and still feeling it, especially during the climate of right now in our time period, everything yeah. that's happening. I loved some of the themes of this film were basically showing you just like the beginning with that guy, what a white liberal is or uh, what they think a white progressive person is as in like no you're my buddy da, 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 da. oh sorry you can't step close you can't use my bathroom but i'm gonna pat you in the back and i'll help you make millions of dollars right yeah. so it's like the subtle racism versus just like the, the blatant racism it, it just reminds me of literally both parties both political parties that we're dealing with so by you talking about that it really does touch that colorism with malcolm x and jim brown and their conversation it, it's it's big it's known it's real so yeah. that's why i'm saying like thank you i'm happy theirs is on because i would i wouldn't feel com uh, to be honest i wouldn't feel comfortable talking about the situation if there wasn't another black voice that was present to talk about his experience watching the film too yeah i mean my experience because i've dealt with my own form of racism relatively mainly in high school that i'm aware of um but in general for me personally i try to separate me personally, my emotions to my logical side of thinking and everything, because I know typically for me, I can get emotional, I can get really too hectic, but then at the end of the day, uh, for me, I don't want to approach my actions from an emotional standpoint. So when I saw this movie, and I saw that, I saw that with, you know, Muhammad Ali quite a bit. Um, and again, because of those differentiations between all the characters and their ideals and their way of thinking and their way of execution, I found fascinating. And of course, the two di the the one dynamic that in interactions I loved the most was between um, Malcolm X and Sam Cooke because they were both approaching how do we support our community, and um and you saw Malcolm X's way, and we all know Malcolm X's way, especially in history. The only thing was typically in American history, I think history in general is that it's always written on the winner side. That's just typically how it always happens. This goes for America, this goes for Japan, China, wherever it is. Um, and so there's a certain ego in history that I wish it wasn't there when you teach it. Um, and so for me, watching this film and just knowing about my parents and their issues with racism and everything like that, and for myself included as well, I love this movie. I love every second of it. I love the dynamics, everything amongst the lines. And it just shows you that racism still exists, you know, prejudice still exists, discrimination still exists. It's just evolved and adapted in a psychological way that not a lot of people can see. And you need these type of mediums like film, like television, like animation, whatever, to bring it to the forefront because it exists. And the only way to, or one of the biggest ways to really tackle it is to talk about it. And I think this movie and amongst others that are considered staples of, hey, every black person should watch, like Roots, like 12 Years a Slave, etc. You need to watch it because this offers a perspective that you need to see. And one of the things I loved about this film is that, hey, we have different perspectives, but you know what? I still respect you mm -hmm. for having this way of how you want to execute it. I may not agree with it, but that's all right. That is who you are. That is not who I am. You know, and especially between Malcolm X and Sam Cooke, they had different ways and it's perfectly fine. Um, and you also see just how into it they are. And again, these are delicate topics. These are uh, not just delicate topics, but also important topics because at the end of the day, even in 2021, racism still exists and you need we need to teach those uh, fundamentals to the younger generation. Because I like as I talk to you, Joe, and one of my other friends that one of my biggest issues, especially in America and racism and, the edu and education and knowing history, I always believe that it comes down to personally, parents educating them, talking to them, communicating it, break really breaking it down for a lot of people to understand. And I thought this movie did it so well, especially in the last, especially in the long scene, that is the important scene, because that just shows you can have a great conversation with different ideals and different philosophies and still be friends at the end of the day. And I think it's more important now more than anything because when you look at where we are more in the world, important. like things have never been more divided. Like everyone has assumptions about each other for whatever reason. 
and there's just like a very mm -hmm. polarizing nature to everything like in our society it's just really it's really sad and like you know people have lost you know friendships over like you know how they like you know view the world and everything like that too yeah so, you know this movie again ended up being important and really in a bigger way than like you know you might have even thought of like as far as like these conversations that these characters have they went in directions that like you know i never would have expected you know um and i think one of the reasons that these characters are so interesting actually before i get into that point there's a point that you made Darius, as far as like uh, the movie being that you wish it was longer i feel like it was like yeah. just, That's just me I, I feel like it was like honestly i feel like it was just the perfect length and the reason why i feel like it was just the perfect length is that like i feel like the pace and the rhythm of this movie was downright perfect honestly i thought it was perfect there's a very much a rhythm there's an energy to this film and i think that has to do in large part with the direction this movie was directed by yeah. regina king this is her feature um directorial debut and i gotta say what a way to go if, if my, if my yeah, feature directorial great. debut <laughs> can be this solid then i could die a hero so i think honestly great <laughs> great job on her part and again like i said this is a director who clearly has control in every part that goes into making a film whether it's um bringing out great performances again four performers are all terrific there's not a weak note in this cast um yeah, whether it's yeah, the cinematography yeah. whether it's the editing whether it's just the overall artistic design of the film and you know going back to the performance i have to give shout outs to everybody you know kingsley benadir as malcolm x leslie odom jr as sam cook aldous hodge as jim brown and eli gory as cassius clay or muhammad ali all of them knock it out of the park like i said big cast or not really so much with big cast but it's a lot of characters that are present throughout pretty much the entire movie and no one eclipses each other and no one falls short of each other they all have different ways of making yeah. themselves known making themselves important and every single one that knocks that out of the park this is a, yeah, great, I definitely, great cast, I, it's a wonderfully utilized cast i agree i agree 100 percent. and points i want two points i wanted to make before uh, first of all shout out to regina king she yes. is a black woman directing it boss lady and you know this could have flopped right because yeah it's just people in a hotel room <laughs> yeah for the most of it yep. so it could have just went left right so we really the the dialogue and the characters development and description really because it's not like a major plot is happening right like there's no cars chasing each other and adrenaline and stuff right it's not there's not none of that fluff it's just real conversation so it could have went left so we have to give a shout out to everyone that wrote it that directed it that produced it it was so good and the second part that I wanted to just uh, piggyback off what Darius said earlier, which is very relatable, it's very true, and because I'm an activist, and I'm very, and as a woman of color, I'm very much passionate about social injustices, um, that it really resonated with me with how Malcolm X it was and how Sam Cooke was, because this is something... The song and dance has been in the African-American community for a lot of years. That's not present in the white community. It isn't present in other communities, and I'm going to tell you why. Because they don't have the privilege, African-Americans, to just be a person and have follow dreams and do this. They always feel the weight of the community in their back of their shoulders. So you see that between Sam Cooke going like, dude, I don't have to talk about social injustice. I just want to make music. And Malcolm X is like, no, you are a voice. You are a prominent voice in history. Do it. Utilize it. Where other people say the majority aka white people in america they don't they don't feel that pressure because they their group has never been oppressed the way african americans have been for the last 400 years so i would just like to say that i really like the dynamic between sam cook and malcolm x people trying to follow their dreams versus feeling the weight of their community that's what i took from that part okay <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Darius had a look on his face like he was going to follow up with that. Story. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, I was, there's a lot I was thinking about, sure. and you know, I was going through. Okay, emotions, logic. No, no, let's separate them right now. Um, but also, one yeah. thing when it comes to emotion and logic is um, when you are debating with someone, let, let's say it, someone that doesn't deal with racism, and you deal with yeah. racism, and you're debating, and you're trying, and you're being logical, but you're emotional just because you are emotional when you're being like logical it doesn't that doesn't invalidate the 
the logic as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm very you know, well. Some, some people feel like, um, some people confuse being calm and collective with having an emotional unattached, like an attachment to the cause. So they're like, look at how I'm talking, look how am I debating, I'm right, even though you're hysterical or emotional, but they, they are not having an emotional attachment to the cause. And I'm just throwing that out there because I've witnessed it and I've been in debates before where people misconstrued what that means. You can be emotional and have logic as well. And just like you said it, you can also separate the two as well. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I kind of wish that I watched this movie a bit sooner because this movie did come out in theaters on Christmas Day and it only came out on Amazon Prime this past Friday. And because um, Darius and I already did our uh, top films of 2020 list. Ah. And this would yeah, I missed it by that much. So this film, honestly, this would have been at the top. Like, yeah? Could, yeah, for me as well. I could, I could see this as easily as a heavy Oscar contender. I think it's already getting a lot of buzz. And it's, like, yeah. I feel like there are a lot of times where Oscar movies, like, you know, they win, but they don't exactly deserve it. And who knows, like, why they win for whatever reason. This movie, I could see this winning and it will absolutely deserve it. What was the first movie that you guys put on your list? Uh, up until this one, I think the number one movie for 2020 for me was Soul. The new Disney picture. But I love Soul! It was Soul beautiful. Was awesome. Soul was awesome. I forget what awesome. was my number one, but I know Soul was up there for me. I think Soul was my number two. Who, what was number one for you, Darius? I, I forgot my number one, but I know Soul was definitely up there. Yeah, yeah. Soul was... It touched us all. I love okay. <laughs> Uh, no, but yeah, okay. so like with One Night in Miami, like one of the things, and because right before I saw that movie, my dad and my family were all talking about race, uh, racism, and I'm not a very vocal person, I guess, in my family talking about these things, because I always like to think about before I talk, that's always, uh, uh, you know, philosophy of like, think before you speak, act, think before you talk, that sort of thing, so I'm just absorbing everything in, and just seeing their perspective and then after watching this movie i was like wow there's a lot of things that people just don't understand in a certain perspective because perspe per perspective and life has a lot of moments and experiences and if you don't experience certain things you're not going to be fully aware of it and so and that's why i love soul for that reason because they sort of you know switch bodies to experience a different world and different pers perspective and point of view and so in one night in Miami, I just, and I have to give a shout out to Eli, the main actor that played Muhammad Ali. Yeah. I remember him from the 100 and that's a TV series. And I kind of liked him, but in this one, he gave it his all. I really liked him. I was like, yeah, he a is a huge good. butt. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, oh, <laughs> <butt."> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I'm like, is it really his butt? Or like did Muhammad Ali also have a big butt and like they put padded on it? But I'm like jealous. I'm like, whoa, this dude has a big butt. Of course you guys probably weren't looking, but I was like, what? No, I didn't I, I did I, see I, that, but I didn't want to think of that. Okay, so you see it and you moved on. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, interesting. Okay, anyway, back to the diet. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's not the direction I thought. <laughs> sorry, I had to just. Uh, sorry, but you were saying, yeah, yeah. He was. A, he 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 knocked it out the park. I think they did a great job casting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Michelle, um, you want to just give us a little info about your podcast, just like the elevator pitch, what it's about exactly, where we can find it, and uh, where your co-host was today. <laughs> And your social security. Uh, all right, elevator pitch. All right, my name is Michelle Batista. My co-host is Sudi Lee. She's not here right now. She is hanging out with her mom um, because she hadn't seen her in a while. Um, we are called the Power Broke Girls. You can find us on YouTube, um, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, um, Apple Music, SoundCloud. Um, we are basically, we're best friends, and we just talk about current events, and um, I think what makes us strong is basically um, our personality, the dynamic and chemistry that we have, that we bounce back from each other, the energy. Um, I also uh, have no filter. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. In today's- uh, you're, always, uh, you're such a quiet lamb, Michelle. Like, I never <laughs> I have no filter. I always have, I always have to wonder exactly what it is you mean when you say it. So that this yes, is yes, yes. This is I am shocking. definitely not mysterious with my opinions. Uh, I have opinions, and I try to be as honest um, and real as a human being as possible, but also in a very polite manner. But um, yeah, we talk about everything. We talk about sex, relationships, cheating, racism. You know, protesting, um, climate, uh, everything. 
age aging just like we don't really have one set thing because we have so many friends from different um aspects of everything so we like to bring them in and talk about it whether it's political whether it's not whether it's social whether it's whatever um so it's awesome power broke girls it's always power before the broke because we're still broke but we are powerful and we're getting there slowly but surely um but it's fun it's always a good time it's silly um but then we can be serious so basically we're just two girls that are package. two catches for the whole package yep. that sounds like my tinder bio it's like we're everything <laughs> you should date me <laughs> Um, see how I made you guys laugh right there? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. No, that wasn't on your Tinder page. No, just kidding. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, again. Well, I'm like my own Tinder, like, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> Hinge, <laughs> Bumble. We don't judge, Darius. So many oh, no, I won't know. <laughs> so many podcasts have, like, a particular niche as far as, like, what they talk about. Like, obviously, Darius and I talk about, like, movies and TV shows. Like, you know, we had another friend of ours on, like, before you, whose uh, podcast is mainly about, like, sports and the Yankees because he's a Yankee. Uh, fanatic even more so than Derek Jeter but like what's interesting about um, your podcast is that your niche is your dynamic between you and your best friend and that dynamic while like yeah everyone you know has a best friend that they have a dynamic with your dynamic with your best friend is different than someone else's dynamic with their best friend and that's what makes your podcast unique thank on you talk about literally everything like you know if it happened here if it happened in australia you're gonna you're gonna talk about it there's no boundaries in our friendship we actually call each other platonic soulmates so um i think that our friendship uh i'm biased because i'm half of the friendship i think it's very special and unique we've been best friends since i was 13. i'm 28 now it's been 15 years so i'm i feel very blessed to have someone like that that has seen me at my worst at my best when i was 13 when i was 15 like when you know and now i'm a grown woman i think i pay my own bills so it's really nice to see someone because they know who you are but they also see you grow and i think it's a very beautiful you think you're a grown woman you are a grown woman <laughs> you are one <laughs> you're right it's like when you get older and you're like hmm yeah. I, would feel more like, I think I'm still there. I'm not sure. It's like, no, put a staple on it. Say what you have no, to say. No, I got say my nails done recently, and now I feel like <laughs> oh. it's like every day or like every year. Every year on my birthday, like, you no, know, my relatives always ask me, like, oh, do you feel any older? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just another year. That's all. <laughs> I, like I grew more hair in my beard. I don't know. We're still the same people. I feel like as long as you're youthful, it's like, I don't know. Age is nothing but a number. Exactly. I didn't get taller, so I don't care. <laughs> I am trying to get skinnier, though, so hopefully, fingers crossed. Oh Jesus! Let's, let's just... <laughs> Joe's like this again. <laughs> like this, this bullshit again. My God. Okay. No, it's All, right. All right. So, Michelle, again, thank you very much for coming on. Maybe the next time you come on, you know, your co-host, your platonic soulmate, will be able to join you. That would be beautiful. Yeah, she would have really enjoyed this. Um, I. I well, I didn't want to wait for anyone, but my roommates also want to watch the movie, so I'm gonna wait for them to watch it and definitely talk about it. But Darius and Joe, thank you guys so much for having me on for entertaining my little quirks, and uh, yeah, definitely feel honored to be here. Little quirks, little quirks. <laughs> Quirk. Well, no, I'll see quirks. I see humans. That's I, it. Like <laughs> it. I like it. We're just beings, beings of humans. I like just, it. Uh, exactly. no, just, just, just kidding. Just kidding. But. Uh... Yeah, um, again, Darius, awesome. Thank you for being here with me today, yet again. And uh, thank you, everybody who's still watching. I'm always here with you, man. <laughs> we're, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna soar together, man. In the film industry, I think the three of us are gonna soar together. Oh, yeah. I have a very good feeling oh, yeah. about what's gonna come. Yeah, get back to my feature. Oh, so. listen, don't ever stop. I'm like, let me leave you guys some lessons. Believe in yourself always. Don't ever stop. Literally, because I feel like the people that never make it or achieve their dreams are the people that gave up. As long as we don't give up, we all make it eventually. Exactly. Like, you know, get exactly. used to the idea of you being... Enjoy the process. Yeah, get used it's to the idea of you being thing. successful. That's what it comes down to. Agreed. Um, yeah. So, yeah, to cap things off, you know, for anyone who's uh, watching on YouTube, don't forget to give this video a like, channel subscription, and hit the bell to get all notifications. Follow all of our social media platforms down below in the description. And, and check out our podcasting platform profiles and on Apple and Spotify. And until next time, Michelle, thank you very much. Dan, thank you guys so much again. Have a great safe weekend. Week, week, week. I don't know. Week, 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 week. week. I'm about to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Take care. All right, you too. You too. All right. And on that note, this has been Cinema Unchained.